today. Uh, does God care about our worship? Does God care about our worship? And the simple answer, of course, is yes. If you take the New American Bible, uh, the word worship or worshipping or worship occurs over a hundred times, many times over a hundred times actually in the Bible. So God certainly does care about our worship. And our worship as Christians uh, comprises of our daily worship as we present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice, like verses 1 and 2. And it involves uh, sessions like what we're doing this morning, when we gather together like this on the first day of the week, when we assemble together to worship God, to edify one another and so on. When I ask this question, uh, does God care about our worship, I'd like us this morning to concentrate on the second aspect there. Not so much our individual lives, but let's concentrate on our assembling together like this. Does God care about our worship as we assemble together? And I'd like to ask uh, three questions today. The first of those three questions is this. Does God care about the object of our worship? Does God care about the object of our worship? And I ask that question because today uh, various people throughout the world worship different objects. Louise has been very kind to uh, get this projector organised here. And uh, focus. And uh, what we have here is uh, over in a place called Ken in Sri Lanka. Now uh, the Buddhists over there believe that they have got under this cover on top of a golden lotus a five centimetre discoloured that they believe, they allege, has come from Buddha. When he was burned, uh, this tooth was recovered and eventually transported to Kandy in Sri Lanka. And the Buddhists hold this discoloured tooth as the most sacred object in the world. And what happens is that tens of thousands, I don't know how we go with COVID of course, but tens of thousands uh, would travel to Kandy in Sri Lanka to gaze at this, uh, this tooth and to give expensive gifts of gold and silver and uh, jewels and so on to the temple. Uh, and so we find people uh, worshipping things like this today. And that's why I've asked the first question, does God care about the object of our worship? Does God care that people are, in effect, reverencing a tooth? Well, we shouldn't just think of today, we should think of in the past as well. People in the past have worshipped various things. Let's open up to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 2. <coughs> in Judges 2, let's read from verse 7. Judges 2, verse 7. The people served the Lord. Now, before we go any further, there, of course, is the true object of our worship. We should be worshipping the Lord. We should be worshipping God. But uh, let's read on. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord uh, which he has done for Israel. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Herods, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Gash. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Baals. They were serving God, they were serving the Lord, but Joshua died and that generation died, and then the next generation began serving the Baals. Verse 12, they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, from the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord and they served Baal and the Ashtoreth. So quite clearly, people not only today are worshipping objects like this too, but uh, in the past, people have worshipped the Baals and the gods of the nations and the Ashtaroth instead of serving the Lord. And as you read through that passage there in Judges 2, think back to the Ten Commandments. So much for the first two of the Ten Commandments. Uh, you shall know the God besides me and uh, don't make idols and so on. Those first two commandments are straight out the window. And I think 
what's very sobering about this passage here is how long did it take for the apostasy to come? It was only one generation, wasn't it? The next generation after Joshua and Moses had died out fell back into worshipping idols. And so that's why we've got a great treasure among us here this morning, our children. And we need to be teaching our children so that when the older generation does pass on and the new generation takes over, they don't fall into apostasy like, uh, like the Israelites did once Joshua and the others had died out. We know from the scriptures, of course, that it's only God who should be the object of our worship. You remember Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 10, to Satan, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He's the only one we worship. In Psalm 95, verse 6, come let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. God has made us all. He's the one that we fall down before and worship. Psalm 95, verse 6. Psalm 97, verse 7. Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Worship God. Don't boast in idols. Be ashamed of idols. Be ashamed of reverencing a tooth. And worship God. And Psalm 132, verse 7. Let us go into his dwelling. Let us worship at his footstool. If they were able to do that under the old covenant, we can do it today as we assemble together to worship God and serve Him only. And why is it that we should be worshipping God and not these other objects? Well, the passage in Psalm 95 has already indicated that He is our Maker. That's why we worship Him. He's the living God. And if you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 9, we'll see that these other uh, objects of worship, they can't even see. They can't even hear. They can't do anything. No good me reverencing a tooth because that's all it is, a tooth, an inanimate object. object. And we read in Revelation chapter 9 verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood. And notice this, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They can't do anything. Why would you want to worship them? Why would you want to reverence them? Why would you want to reverence a tooth? What can a tooth do, you, do for you? Absolutely nothing. But it's God. God our maker, you see, that we worship. In fact, while we're in the book of Revelation, and uh, just before we leave that passage, remember that uh, this was something that was taking place in the third century. The church was in existence, of course, when people were still worshipping idols and stone and rock and whatever else, uh, timber and, uh, and metal. But while we're in Revelation, let's go across to Revelation chapter 22. Remember that not even angels are to be worshipped. It's God alone that should be worshipped. In Revelation 22 verse 8, <coughs> I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things, worshipping the angel. But notice verse 9, but he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. And there again is the object of our worship, you see. Worship God. Not angels even, but God and God alone. And so that's our first question for this morning. Does God care about the object of our worship? Well, certainly he does. He is to be the object of our worship. Not a tooth and not idols, not anything else, but God alone. And he has the right to demand our worship. He is the one that's created us and given us all things. That's why we should be worshipping him. Let's move on to the second question I'd like to ask this morning. Uh, does God care how often I worship him? Does God care how often I worship him? Uh, sometimes over the years uh, we've associated with different brethren and so on and it appears sometimes that uh, some brethren are not too bothered if they miss out on worshipping together. They miss out on assembling together. Not too bothered at all. They can take it all even. Now, other brethren seem to be not too fussed if they, they regularly rock up to the assembly very late and miss the first few songs and perhaps even the sub. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to worry them too much. Is God concerned about how often I worship Him? Let's think about uh, why we're really here this morning. Why is it that we're really here? 
Is it just a habit or a routine that we've gotten into that on Sunday morning now we wouldn't know what to do if we didn't have somewhere to go like this? I mean, habit or routine is fine. There's nothing wrong with habit or routine, but if we're just coming in here out of habit or routine on its own, then uh, we need to rethink things. Perhaps we're coming here this morning because our parents have put pressure on us and we feel forced as if we've got to come. Is that why we're really here this morning? And it makes you wonder then, doesn't it, that uh, what's going to happen when the parents die out? Is there still going to be worship offered to God in the way that he wants it? Are we meeting in this particular building, the scout hall, uh, because we think it's going to be a, a way of reaching into the community? Well, that's a noble purpose and that might be a possibility, but is that the only reason we're meeting here this morning? Are we meeting to edify one another and build up one another? Well, yes, we certainly are doing that, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, but is that the only reason we're here this morning? Surely, the main reason that we want to be here this morning is for the privilege and the honour of worshipping God, worshipping our Maker in the way that He has authorised us to come together and worship Him. Whether or not our parents force us, doesn't matter what reason we're here, our main reason should be to worship God, to worship our Creator. I'd like to look at two passages from Psalms. Uh, let's go back to Psalm 19. <coughs> In Psalm 19, verse 1. For the choir director, a psalm of David, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the expanse is declaring the work of his hands. When was the last time we went outside and took a bit of time just to gaze up into the stars on a clear night and just to ponder the greatness of our God who has made such vast universes? At his word, God spoke and they came forth. This is the God that we gather here this morning to worship. He is our creator. He is the object of our worship and we should be very keen and enthusiastic to come as often as we can to worship the Lord who has made these wonderful things. Let's cross over to Psalm 139. Recently we've seen babies uh, born and, uh, and uh, as we consider our own bodies, let's not forget Psalm 139 verse 14. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Have you stopped to consider how your body operates? And the length of uh, capillaries and veins and arteries through your body. And how your eye operates. I mean, if you damage your eye, if you lose your sight, can you send someone down to Coles to buy another couple of eyes so you can whack those in? Well, of course you can't. But God has made our eyes. God has made our body as they are. He is our maker. And we fall down and we worship before Him. In uh, our community at the moment, it seems, uh, everyone is very keen to... To, uh, to follow superheroes or to crave for superheroes. Uh, I mean, you've got Superman and Captain America and Iron Man and all the rest of them. Uh, and these could be a bit of fun, I guess, but uh, there's some breaking news to some of us. Uh, these people are not real. They're just a fantasy. Yeah. Sorry to break the news, Trap, but uh, <laughs> you know, they're not real. Uh, who is our superhero? Who is the one that is real and is a superhero because he... He released us from our sins by His blood. Revelation 1 verse 6, surely Jesus is our superhero. And that's why we should be gathering this morning. Yes, we can edify each other. Yes, we might be able to reach out to the community. There might be a lot of good reasons for meeting there, but that's the prime one. We're here to worship God and worship His Son, Jesus. He is the true superhero in the world at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> if I said to you this morning, uh, before you got here, that... Uh, I think the Prime Minister will be here this morning. Or maybe uh, if I said Queen Elizabeth's made a special trip to be with us this morning. Or maybe uh, if I said that some sporting hero was going to be here this morning, maybe Nick Natanui, uh, the kids know him. Uh, I wonder whether we'd be keener to turn up for an assembly like that. Well, they're not going to be here this morning, of course. They're not here this morning. But have you considered who is here this morning? Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. We've got God, we've got Jesus in our midst if we're meeting according to his authority. And isn't that far greater than any person we can have with us? 
that's our motivation for being keen and for not missing our assembling together because we're here to worship and worship God and worship His Son. <coughs> God deserves our worship, so I should want to be here every time that I can worship God together with my group. That's how often God wants us to worship, as often as we can be here. Now, sometimes we might be ill, we might not be able to make it for one or other reasons, but uh, if we can make it, God wants us to be here and wants us to worship as often as we can. I know we're commanded to assemble, Hebrews 10 verse 25, don't forsake our own assembling together. Certainly it's our duty, it's a commandment for us to do these things, but surely our worship's much more than just a commandment. Surely we're not coming here just out of duty alone. I wonder how many people remember the greatest commandment of all. The top one, number one. Well, let's see what it is in, uh, in Matthew 22. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was asked this very question. Matthew 22 verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said... You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And Jesus went on to say, if you obey this commandment, you'll keep all the other commandments anyway. That's the greatest and uh, foremost commandment. Now I put it to you this morning. If you show someone to me who loves God with all their heart and soul and mind and body, I'll show you someone who's never going to miss out on assembling together with the saints when they're able to. That should be our motivation, you see. Not just out of a sense of duty and uh, uh, obeying a command not to forsake your assembly. That's important. But it should be more than that. It should be out of our great love for God and wanting to worship God in the way that He has instructed us to. That's why we should be here this morning. Does God care how often I worship Him? Yes, He certainly does. And He wants us to worship Him not out of duty, but out of our great love for Him. Think about what we've done already this morning. We've been able to sing together. Ephesians 5 verse 19. Let's remember what, it, uh, what our singing involves. Ephesians 5 verse 19. In Ephesians 5 verse 19, we are certainly speaking to one another. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs were certainly teaching one another. But let's read on in Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's why we're here to worship. We're singing to the Lord. Yes, or of course to each other as well. But primarily to the Lord. We're here to worship God. Out of love for God. Because He is our maker and we owe Him everything. Physically and spiritually in, in the church in salvation. Trav's already mentioned in his supper talk this morning, Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayer. If we're not here assembling together, we miss out on all of that. We miss out on the apostles' teaching. We miss out on the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper. We miss out on the prayers and uh, the fellowship and the singing and the contribution and so on. <coughs> Let's turn back to Psalm 119 because... When you think about being able to gather like this and being able to hear God's word being proclaimed and so on, we should have the attitude that the uh, psalmist had in Psalm 119. And I'd like to pick out just a few verses here. If we've got this attitude, then uh, we're never going to want to miss assembling together with our brethren. You can read the whole of Psalm 119, but you'll remember it's a very long psalm, so we won't do that this morning. But let's pick out a few of the verses here. And see what it's like to uh, hear God's word, to hear the apostles' teaching and so on. In Psalm 119, let's start at verse 20. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. Isn't that a marvellous little verse? The attitude of the psalmist was that he was longing for the word of God. Now he could, uh, he could read the word of God on his own, of course. But even more, when you get together and you assemble with the brethren and in the New Testament times when you hear the apostles' teaching, do we long to hear what this teaching is? Let's go down to 103, verse 103, Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Why would you want to miss assembling together where you can hear God's word if you had this attitude? 
that God's word is just so sweet. I mean, after Sunday morning, we normally go home and have lunch, and I, I presume with most of us, that lunch is pretty sweet and nourishing and so on. But we've got something that's far more sweeter here and better than any physical food we could ever have. And that should be our attitude, you see. We don't want to, we don't want to miss out on hearing this wonderful word as it's proclaimed. Let's skip down to verse 111. I've inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Isn't it great to be able to read about salvation through Jesus and the church which he purchased with his blood and the hope of the righteous and the way God wants us to live? This should be joy and happiness and rejoicing. Of course we all want to meet together as often as we can to share in the, uh, the teaching of God's word. Let's go down to verse 127. Therefore I love your commandments above gold. Above fine gold. Not just gold on its own, but fine gold. The very best of gold that you could get. I love your commandments even more than that. How often should we, uh, we worship God? As often as we can. As often as we meet together, we should make sure that we're here so that we can hear God's marvellous word, which is uh, far more valuable than even much fine gold. Let's go down to verse 162. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. If we had the psalmist attitude, we'd never miss assembling together. If we were well enough to come and nothing else prevented us from coming, we'd be here all the time, wouldn't we? So that we can share in this marvellous word that we long after, that's sweet, that's a joy to our heart, that's more valuable than fine gold, and is like finding great spoil, great treasure. It's a great privilege, you see, a great blessing to get together to worship God. And so there's our second question. Does God care how often I worship? He certainly does care. He wants us out of love to obey His commandments and to be together and worship Him every time we can. Well, let's finish this morning with our third question. Uh, does God care how we worship Him? Does God care how we worship Him? Um, is God just concerned that we turn up once a week on a Sunday morning and offer Him anything we choose to offer? Is that what God wants? No. Even if we're regular in our attendance on a Sunday morning, for example, that's not just what God wants. He's concerned also about how we worship Him. Let's go to Psalm 29. In Psalm 29, verse 2, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in holy array. And I'd like you to notice the second part of that verse in particular. Worship the Lord in holy array. If you've got the King James this morning, it'll say, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And what that's getting at is that God wants us to worship Him in a way which is holy, which is, uh, which is righteous, which is the way that He has prescribed as we'll see in a moment in Leviticus chapter 10. We're not to worship Him in ways that are not holy. We're not to uh, bring in a, uh, a rock band and start uh, beating on the drums and so on. God hasn't authorised that. We're not to bring in belly dancers that can entertain us as we uh, supposedly worship God in euphoria of belly dance. Uh, we're not to bring in so-called priests dressed in clown costumes. Now, now, all of this sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But this happens in our world today. These kinds of things are going on and are being offered to God as worship. Does God care how we worship? Of course he does. And he's not going to accept our terms of worship. He's only going to accept what he has uh, outlined for us. To see that God doesn't accept any old worship that's offered to him, let's go back to that uh, passage I mentioned a few moments ago, Leviticus 10. In Leviticus 10, we, uh, we are reminded here of the story of Nadab and Abihu, who thought they could alter the worship that God had prescribed. Let's read this here in Leviticus 10, verse 1. <clears throat> now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had, now notice this, he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Now what's interesting, I think, is verse 3. Then Moses said to Aaron, 
It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as... Now notice that word there. I'll be treated as holy. Does that remind you of Psalm 29, verse 2 that we just looked at? Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This is the holiness that God wants, keeping His commandments. Not, not changing His commandments and offering Him something different. So here in verse 3, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honoured. So Aaron therefore kept silent. God certainly does want us to worship Him in the way that He has prescribed. And He's not going to accept any old worship we toss up to Him. Nadab and Abai, you found that out the hard way. That you can't alter God's commands and Him be uh, accepting of that worship. Let's have a look at a second example in 1 Kings 12. And this one I find particularly uh, troubling. It's sad to see Nadab and Abihu be destroyed, but in 1 Kings chapter 12, there was an evil king called Jeroboam. When the kingdom uh, split, the kingdom of Israel split into north and south. He was worried about his northern kingdom going to the south to worship in the temple. And so he got a bit crafty. And he said, look, let's make a few subtle changes to uh, worship. Sadly, that not only affected his own generation, but that, uh, those changes influenced the generations from then on. And that northern kingdom never, ever recovered from those changes to worship that Jeroboam made until it was eventually uh, taken into Assyrian captivity. Let's read the, uh, in uh, 1 Kings 12, verse 28. The king consulted and made two golden calves and said to them, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. <coughs> he said one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. So two golden calves, well that's abhorrent to start with. But notice verse 31. He made houses on the high places and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. So the people could say, well, yes, we've got our priests. They don't happen to be from Levi that God had commanded, but we've still got our priests. Let's read on, verse 32. Jeremiah instituted a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. It's on the wrong day, but it's like the one in Judah, so near enough's good enough, according to Jeroboam. And he went up to the altar, and thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart. He made up the time, not God's time. He devised it in his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar and burned incense. Crafty changes, subtle changes. Remember the devil is described as crafty in Genesis 3 verse 1. Changing the worship around, altering it. And uh, these changes, as I said, uh, the northern kingdom never recovered from this. Regularly, the following kings, generation after generation, were said to be walking in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebo. False worship to God until eventually they were carted away into captivity. Does God uh, care about how we worship Him? Certainly He does. Nadab and Abihu found that out. The northern kingdom of Israel found that out under Jeroboam and the following evil kings. Let's have a look at one last example of this. So let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we've got here a fellow called King Uzziah of the southern kingdom. <coughs> he became strong, but sadly when he became strong, he became arrogant. And he was a king, so he was of the tribe of Judah, and he thought he'd take it upon himself to go into the temple and offer incense, which was only allowed for the tribe of Levi, remember, the priests and the, uh, the tribe of Levi. So let's pick it up in 2, King, uh, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16. When he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. For he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Then Azariah the priest entered after him, and with him eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. Now notice verse 18. They opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, it is not for you, as I, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary. You have been unfaithful and will have no honour from the Lord God. But Isaiah, with a census in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. 
And while he was enraged, so he, he was this king. He was going to take upon himself this worship in the temple. He wasn't going to listen to these priests who were rightly telling him, it's not for you to do this. And he became enraged at them. And uh, notice what he goes on to say in verse 19. While he was enraged with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before all the priests in the house of the Lord beside the altar of incense. Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him. And behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And they hurried him out of there. And he himself also hastened to get out because the Lord had smitten him. King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And he lived in a separate house, being a leper. But he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Does God care how we worship him? Of course he does. And certainly God is not going to accept all worship that's offered to him. Nadab and Abihu, Jeroboam, King Uzziah all found this out. That God does care about how we worship him. And so this means, of course, that in Perth today, God is not going to accept all the, all, uh, all the worship that's being offered up to him around the different uh, groups that are meeting, uh, perhaps even now on this first day of the week. He's not going to accept all of that worship. For some of those people that are offering uh, God worship this morning have substituted skits for the Apostles' teaching, acting and plays and so on, instead of having the Apostles' teaching. God's not going to accept that. Some people... Uh, only have the Lord's Supper once a year instead of having it on uh, the first day of the week as Travis pointed out this morning. Some have allowed women to speak in their midst. God's not going to accept that worship because he's explained to us in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 that the women are to keep silent in the churches. Some are offering to God uh, worship that involves uh, choirs and even soloists. Whereas God's command in Ephesians 5 verse 19 is, uh, as we've seen, we all sing together. We don't have choirs. We don't have solos. Some this morning are worshipping God by adding instruments to the worship. Instruments of music. And some of these people say, well look, God hasn't said don't use the instrument, so it must be okay. But what they don't understand, of course, is that God has told us what to do. To sing and make melody with our heart. He doesn't need to tell us all the things we don't need to do. When we go to a restaurant, we look at the menu. Do we say to the old, uh, to the uh, the waiter, oh, "I'm going to have uh, not that dish there, and not this dish here, and not that dish there, and not this one here, and so on"? We don't do that, do we? We just say, "I'll have this dish." Spaghetti bolognese, I think it was Tuesday night with Louise and family for Ben's birthday. That's what I ordered. I didn't say to the waiter, "I'm not going to have that." And, and God's the same. He says, "Sing and make melody with your heart." He doesn't say, "Don't use musical instruments and don't stand on your head." He doesn't need to say those things. He tells us what he requires. People today, sadly, are offering to God worship which he will not accept. And we know that because he's told us what he will accept. God does care how we worship him. But uh, as we draw to a close this morning, I'd like us on this point to think of something else. Uh, we can offer to God this morning all the correct items of worship that he requires. We can sing. We can share in the Lord's Supper. We can hear from the Apostle's Word and so on. We can do all of the right things this morning. And yet our worship can still be unacceptable to God. <clears throat> and what I mean here is found in Isaiah 1. Let's turn to Isaiah 1. sacrifices. 
They were uh, holding the correct festivals and the Sabbaths and so on. They were honouring all of these things. But let's read on here at the end of verse 13. God says, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. So we might be offering to God all the correct items of worship. But if our life is full of sin, and we're unrepentant of that sin, then our worship is not acceptable to Him. Let's read on verse 14. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Uh, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. They had been guilty of uh, uh, killing the innocent and doing whatever else uh, evil that they were doing. And then they were coming and offering to God these sacrifices. And God said, no, I'm not accepting it. Even though they were offering the sacrifices that God had commanded, he refused to accept it. You see, what we've got to remember under the New Covenant is our worship of God is not just what we do here on a Sunday morning. Our worship to God really goes from Sunday morning to the next Sunday morning, doesn't it? God expects us to be serving Him right throughout the week so that when we do assemble on this first day of the week, uh, He can accept our worship as we offer it to Him in the way He's authorised. Think about the week that you just had. Have you shown concern for the uh, widows? Have you uh, ceased to do evil and learned to do good? Have you repented of evil through this week? Let's read on in the passage, Isaiah 1 verse uh, 16. God goes on to say through Isaiah, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Our worship is not just what we do on a Sunday morning, it's what we do from one Sunday morning to the next. And we touched on this earlier on, our body should be a living and holy sacrifice, even though we're concentrating on our assembly together for the lesson this morning. <coughs> Let's uh, finish off by going to John chapter 4. There's another way in which we might be offering to God the correct items of worship, and yet He still not accept our worship. And that might be uh, through here in uh, John 4 verse 23. Jesus says, An hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshippers. God is spirit and those who worship must. And I'll get you to highlight mentally in your own word, in your own mind that word must. Must worship in spirit and truth. But we've spent a bit of time this morning considering worshipping in truth. We've got to do things the way that God says they are to be done. But I'd like you to notice that other word there. We must be worshipping in spirit. No good if we're offering up to God the worship He's authorised if, uh, if our mind's a thousand miles away, so to speak. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15. He talked about the hypocrites who honour me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Matthew 15, verses 7 and 8. We've got to concentrate. We've got to focus on what we're doing. And when we're singing our songs, we're not just letting our mouth move, but our mind's thinking about something, something else. What can I have for lunch today? Or uh, what's going to happen next week? Or what happened last week? You see, God expects not only us to live holy lives through each week as we come to worship, but in the very worship itself, we've got to offer Him items according to the truth of His Word and in spirit. Participating in it with focus, with concentration, and thinking about what we're doing. <clears throat> and so this third question, does God care how we worship Him? Well, we're certain that God doesn't accept all worship that's offered to Him. We've seen many examples of that this morning. We've seen that if we're going to worship God and be acceptable to Him, we must, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so uh, that's the end of our lesson this morning. Does God care about our worship? We've seen that does, uh, God certainly does care about the object of our worship. We don't. We don't worship some five centimetre discoloured tooth, an inanimate object like that. We don't worship idols of gold and silver and stone. We don't even worship idols of plastic, credit cards, money. You can't serve God and uh, mammon or God and wealth, Matthew 6 verse 24. 
We've seen this morning that uh, God is uh, certainly concerned about the object of our worship. It should be Him and Him alone. Worship God. He has the right. He is the maker of us all. He is the one that we should worship. And we've seen this morning that God cares about how often we worship. We should see worship as a, a privilege and something that's uh, out of love. We can't wait to offer God. We can't wait to get together again to worship God and to serve Him as He's commanded. And we've seen thirdly this morning that God does care about how we worship Him. He's not going to accept any old worship we toss up and think that that's a good thing. We've got to be worshipping in truth and in spirit. And this is a must. There's no, there's no room for uh, manoeuvring in a must. You must have spirit and you must have truth if He's going to accept the, the worship. This morning, uh, let's appreciate what we do as we gather together. And let's resolve that from now on we're going to worship only God as often as we can, and always in spirit and in truth. <coughs> this morning as we finish, we extend the invitation to uh, all to come and worship God. If you haven't come to worship God in the way that He's authorised, you need to believe and repent and be baptised. If you're here this morning and you have done that, uh, but you've gone away from the worship, you've gone away from these truths, and we'd urge you to repent and confess those sins. And for those of us this morning that have already believed and repented and been baptised, let's remain faithful uh, until death and appreciate the greatness of the privilege of worshipping God together. Let's uh, open up in our songbooks to 